So we finally saw um, how we get a common fund. Um, we authorize, in the technical sense, in becoming the authors of the sovereign to be our actor, to act, to judge, and to act in our name. Um, and we are responsible for his judgment and his action. We do this for Hobbes by all covenanting with one another to transfer our right of nature to the person who becomes a sovereign. And at the end last time, I was emphasizing that this is a covenant we all make with one another, but the sovereign is not party to it. So from the point of view of the sovereign, he is receiving all of our rights of nature as a free gift in the technical sense, as a gift. He doesn't give up anything. So our question was, our questions were, first of all, um, why it's impossible for Hobbes, it's impossible for us to all change our minds, take back our right of nature, maybe transfer it to someone else if we don't like the job that the sovereign is doing first. Um, and second, uh, couldn't we transfer our right of nature to the sovereign initially conditionally and make sure that conditionally, that is make the sovereign promise to do something in exchange for receiving our right of nature. To make the sovereign party to the covenant also. And that would be a way of being able to reclaim our right of nature if the sovereign doesn't do what he covenant, covenanted to do. Okay, so let me just answer the first part of that question really quickly. So why is it irrevocable and unconditional? And, and the answer to the first question is easy. Um, if we're already bound to a sovereign, then we have no right to transfer our right of nature to somebody else because it's not ours anymore. If there is a sovereign, that means we have all transferred our right of nature to him. And agreeing to follow someone else's judgment and action, to authorize someone else, is not something that we have a right to anymore. We've already transferred it to somebody else. So if you and I make a contract for me to sell you my bicycle, and I give you my bicycle, and you give me the $100 that we agreed to, We've transferred our rights. I no longer have a right to the bicycle. You no longer have a right to $100. And if next week you regret that because somebody else has a better, would have had a better deal to offer you, you can't say, I'm going to take back the bicycle and give it to somebody else for $120. It's not yours anymore. Similar. Once we've set up a sovereign, if we have a sovereign, We've transferred our right of nature to him, and we can't transfer it to somebody else. It's not ours. OK, um, so I'll say one more word about that. Um, uh, notice the conditional. If we already have a sovereign, then we've transferred our right of nature to him. It's no longer ours to give to somebody else. Notice, if we have a sovereign, we've transferred our right of nature to him. We've transferred our right to judge for ourselves and act on the basis of that judgment about what's best to that individual. So our judgment, our own judgment, that maybe we like that other would-be sovereign better, it's not our judgment to make if we actually have a sovereign. Okay, so that was the easy part. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just a general question. Let's say, uh, well, in the state of nature, everybody's equal, right? It's a natural equality. Yes, yes. more or less. Right. right, but when the sovereign comes in, when there is common well, yes. do, is there still equality, or due to the sovereign who is, you know, 
is Great. better than the others. Great. Like so therefore, Great. there's no quality. Great question. So what do you think? So in the state of nature, we're all roughly equal to one another. In a, once we've made a common law, once we've transferred our right of nature to, let's say the sovereign is a natural person, an individual human being who becomes sovereign. We may have other variations on that that we'll talk about later, but imagine it's just a monarch, like one person. So is that person more powerful than the rest of us? Why? Then what can be bound by laws that he has to bear on Okay, so he's for sure not bound, um, but back in the state of nature, we weren't bound either. So, right, so we've entered into a commonwealth, now we are bound, and we're bound by what specifically? The covenant binds us in what way? To what? Yes. To him, exactly. So, so, you might say, well, look, that sovereign, you might say, is just the same old dude who was running around in the state of nature, no more physically powerful than anybody else. So in a certain sense, still physically maybe equal roughly to all of us. But that's just considering him as a natural person. There's a sense in which now, as sovereign, he's much more powerful than being merely a natural person. There's a sense in which he's also now an artificial person. And his power consists in his ability to tell us all what to do. So there's a sense in which all of our strength and power, not physical, of course, but our ability to judge and to act for ourselves, uh, gets all of all of our powers and judgments get combined and concentrated in him. So now he has, in an in an, in an artificial sense, in a creative sense, all of the strength and power of all of us. So he really is much more powerful, considered as an artificial person than all the rest of us mere natural person. How does it work with people wanting to have a say you have a sovereign and then someone who's one of their subjects as a child? Good. So this is a good question. We'll come to that later. I was going to say, so everyone else under the sovereign, owns the sovereign makes law is essentially equal to both sovereigns and the laws. They're all subjects. So they are all required by their agreement to be obedient to his judgment and his action. They all are authors of his actions. We all are responsible for what he judges and causes to happen. So let, me just, let me just emphasize, all of this is true if we have a sovereign. This is what's required in order for there to be a genuine sovereign. So, if we don't have that, we don't actually have a sovereign, and what? And we're still in the state of nature. Exactly. Uh, Fulso says that we have to acknowledge um, the equality if it's true, and um, we have to admit it if it's not. But, Sorry. But yeah, well, the, um, like, the law of nature requires us requires us to acknowledge, in the case of its real, the equality, and to admit it if it's not. Where are you reading from? It's the ninth book. Ninth book. Page 97, 97. Ninth book. Oh, so this is against pride. This is, so this is basically Hobbes saying um, that we have to recognize so you're right. I mean, so, so we have to recognize our natural condition is one of rough equality. He thinks the point is simply this: he thinks that people have a tendency to value or assess themselves higher than others. So people think people have a tendency to think, "Oh, I'm so much more clever than everybody else." 
I'm so much more wise than everybody else. But in fact, he thinks that's basically just because I'm more familiar with myself than everybody else. So we have to look, so we have to overcome that, that partiality, that pride, in order to be able to get out of the state of nature. And that's why it's a law of nature. Okay, so why is it that we can't make an agreement with the sovereign to be, who would be sovereign, limiting what he's entitled to do? Yeah. Like I said earlier, it's because um, if he's making a law, he's the one that binds, and if he's the one that binds, he's also unbind, and he can't bind himself. Good. So Hobbes actually gives two arguments here on 111. That's close to the second one. The first one, I want you to note, um, so paragraph four there. Um, he says, how is this? Yeah, sorry. Um, wouldn't it be that the first argument is saying that you would be making a covenant with the sovereign before there is a sovereign in place, and any covenants before there is a sovereignty is void? Well, it's a good question whether um, a covenant made before some, there's a sovereign is void. It seems that way. But of course, <coughs> the covenant that we make with each other to transfer our right of nature to the sovereign also is before there's a sovereign. And that better not be void, right? Or else there's no way out of the state of nature. So you're, you're putting your finger on a peculiar feature of either one of these elements, right? the, the one that he actually describes, or the potential one with the sovereign. And that is that there's a sense in which it is or has to be sort of self-enforcing. It has to be the kind of agreement that once it's made, removes reasonable doubt about whether there's going to be compliance or not. So maybe, maybe, maybe there is a problem with the one with the would-be sovereign. Okay, but what Hobbes says here is that if, think about how we would do this. His first argument is this. Think about how we would have to do this. Either the sovereign, so we're trying to imagine a covenant that the sovereign makes himself commitment that he makes in order to get us to transfer our right of nature to him. In other words, something he gives up. Okay, in order to do that, there are um, two